Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and let's talk about incidentalomas. Uh, before we spoke about some of the general principles, how frequently we're going to see them, now let's look at some specific examples and what tips we can give you. Now, when you see a lesion like this, think about the ER, an incidental lesion, well-defined high density, 86 Hounsfield units. You don't need to think very much. That's a high density renal cyst. There's no magic. Now the trick is, this also shows the importance of non-contrast scans. If you would have looked at the patient's arterial phase imaging, you would have seen a well-defined lesion with 94 Hounsfield units. You would have said, aha, this is a papillary renal cell carcinoma. So one of the challenges in the uh, incidental findings, be in the ER or elsewhere, a single phase study, you see a well-defined lesion like this, what are you going to say? You could say it's a renal cell, and that would explain why 25% of renal masses under 4CM resected or benign. Or you can say, wait a second, it could be a papillary, but maybe it's a high-density renal cyst. Let me bring the patient back and do a non-contrast scan. And that same patient, if you did delayed phase imaging, it would be 84 or 82, depending on how you measure it. But again, if you only saw this, you would say, voila, papillary renal cell carcinoma. So what I'm saying is you can see many renal lesions. Some are high density, but if you only have a single face, it would be impossible to say what's a high density renal cyst from what's a papillary renal cell carcinoma. Their values can be very similar and papillaries can be very well defined. Now, a good uh, hint is if I see something the same on non-contrast and arterial or non-contrast and delayed, same density, then I know it's not enhancing, then I know it's a high-density renal cyst. But you need to have two phases. Very, very important. Article by Jonish makes the point. Homogeneous renal mass measuring over 70 Hounsfield units on non-contrast, 99.9% .9 that it's a benign lesion. So there really is nothing to really to have to think about. Very, very simple. O'Connor, the incidental finding of a renal mass is relatively common and unenhanced CT, but imaging criteria can be used for reliable identification. Mean attenuation alone appears reliable for determining which renal masses need further evaluation. And what they said was that a mass over a CM with fat or less than 20 attenuation or over 70 was considered benign if it didn't contain thickened wall or septations or a mural nodule. But they said was between 20 and 70, that was the danger zone. If you had something measuring 40 Hounsfield units non-contrast, you had to worry about that. Or even 40 or 50 with contrast, that is the zone of concern. Article by Pooler, all proven renal cells contained uh, non-calcified regions that measured 20 to 70 Hounsfield units on non-contrast scans. Again, indeterminate renal lesions on non-contrast CT within the 20 to 70 Hounsfield unit zone are in the danger zone, and these are the ones that need to be worked up. Non-contrast under 20 or over 70 can be a leave-alone lesion. Pooler again, Given the renal lesions completely outside this range have proven to be benign in prior work, we conclude that indeterminate renal lesions on non-contrast CT contain regions of attenuation that cross over into the 20 to 70 danger zone. And those are the ones that require further evaluation. We made this very nice chart, non-contrast scans of the kidney. You see 20 to 70 indeterminate, over 70 high density renal cysts, under 20, a simple cyst, and of course, minus 20 would be an angiomyolipoma, with 37 being the classic measurement where our concern is the greatest. Another example here, you look at this lesion, you say solid mass, hypovascular, renal cell, papillary in type. Look at the excretory phase, well-defined solid mass papillary. If you measure the, the uh, mass on the excretory phase and on the early phase imaging, the attenuation would have been the same. If the attenuation doesn't change, to me, that's highly suspicious. You're dealing with a high density lesion and it's not a malignancy. And sure enough, you brought the patient back for a non-contrast scan and it measured over 70 Hounsfield units. This was a high density renal cyst. Just a very nice example 
of how you can save this patient from biopsy or partial nephrectomy. Obviously, incidental findings like this when the lesion is all fat is a myelolipoma. Under 5 cm, you typically would follow it. But again, typically a female who's in their 40s, patients with tuberous sclerosis get renal angiomyelipomas, but they usually have multiple lesions. Now, that's an easy case because it was all fat. This is a trickier case. You see a little dot on the non-contrast scan right there and there, and then you see better on the contrast scan what looks like a renal mass. So surely you're going to worry about a renal cell carcinoma. But if you go ahead and notice the patient has a few of these lower density zones that in this case measures minus 12 Hounsfield units. What we're dealing with here is an angiomyolipoma, but it's a fat, poor angiomyolipoma. So yes, it's very easy to pick up and diagnose lesions when they're larger and they're all fat, but if you see a lesion with punctate fat, it's a myelolipoma. Same thing in this case, there's a lesion in the right kidney, it's under a CM. Now new guidelines basically say under a CM, simply follow, don't do anything. So that would have worked out well, but if you look carefully, this lesion has a lower density center, and if you put a cursor there, it's minus 63. That's fat, this is a small angiomyolipoma. Now, one of the other common parts of the GU tract with incidental findings would be the adrenal. And in fact, incidentaloma was really what was written about when you spoke about adrenal lesions. So what's an incidentaloma? It's a non-functioning adrenal tumor discovered on an imaging study performed for indications exclusive of adrenal-related conditions. So in saying that, and when you look at articles, this article by Song, 5% of patients have adrenal adenomas, incidental findings. Now, the truth is, if you scan older patients, patients with diabetes, patients who are obese, female patients, it could reach even 8 to 10%. But Song made the point, in 970 consecutive patients with no known cancer, no evidence of known malignancy, the adrenal lesions were benign mainly adenomas, but occasionally myelolipomas. Once you have a malignancy, then you have to worry about metastasis. But, so in their uh, practice, it basically showed that just do nothing, okay? And they even showed, even uh, incidentally detected adrenal masses with attenuation over 10 were benign in patients with no known malignancy. So forget under 10 or zero, they say even under 20. And again, follow-up would be limited and necessary. And Corwin goes so far as to say, what if you have bilateral adrenal nodules, but you have no history of cancer? They ended up saying the same thing, that it was benign. So again, we found no cases of malignancy in 322 incidentally detected bilateral adrenal nodules. These were simply bilateral adenomas. With thin section CT, and you look very carefully, it's not hard to see small adenomas. And again, Corwin made the point, the finding of our study is important because the increased use of CT and the increased resolution have led to an increase in incidental findings unrelated to initial diagnosis. This can lead to extensive further cascades of imaging and interventional workups that can be costly and cause morbidity and psychological stress. So their thing was, leave things alone. On the flip side, the endocrinologists are not that comfortable. Adrenal incidentalomas are found in 4% of patients undergoing abdominal imaging, typically older patients, 6th and 7th decade. Detection of an incidental finding warrants clinical, biochemical, and radiologic evaluation to establish a secretory status and risk of malignancy. Careful review of the lipid content size imaging phenotype is needed but identification of an adrenal uh, incidentaloma may be an opportunity to identify an underlying secretory tumor that may have not been otherwise recognized. So what they were saying is, don't simply say it's an adenoma. Perhaps you need to work people up more. Again, not just looking at the imaging, but looking at clinical biochemical information as well will become important. So when you pick up an adrenal lesion, obviously history is important. 
If a patient's cushionoid, you're thinking of a carcinoma or an adenoma. If the patient's hypertensive, you're thinking about a pheo. Then we also look at size, unilateral versus bilateral. What size is it? What's its attenuation? Does it contain fat? Is it low attenuation? Does it enhance? Does it wash out? All of these things we typically think about. Several things we've learned. Under 10 Hounsfield units, it's an adenoma. Under 4 cm, under 10 Hounsfield units, stop. There's no reason to go further. And you can see in this case, the attenuation is zero. That's a very nice adenoma. Okay, mean of zero. You can see the minimum and maximum, but we go with the mean, a little over one centimeter circle. So it's very simple. But in this case, what if you had given contrast? You see that on the arterial phase, at 30 seconds, the lesion measures 64 Hounsfield units. So if you would have scanned this patient and pick up this incidental adrenal lesion, you would have been concerned because it's 64. You cannot call it an adenoma. Now we notice that at 10 minutes, it washed out more than 50%. Now typically we talk about washout of adrenal lesions with a 15 minute delay and say that if a lesion washes out, more than 60%, it's an adenoma. Now, of course, the caveat is you're not dealing with a pheochromocytoma, but a key thing with adrenal lesions is when you scan them, and so the washout value becomes important, as was shown. Also, the point is things sort of look benign, but you can't call them benign because they just look okay. Here was an adrenal nodule, it's a sonometer, but it measures 50 Hounsfield units. You can't call it an adenoma, you gotta do a washout value. When you do a washout value, the lesion enhances, and now it measures 164 Hounsfield units. Anything above 120, surely 130, is a pheochromocytoma. So this is easy. This was an incidental pheo. It used to be said, oh no, there's no incidental pheos, patients all have hypertension. We pick up more incidental pheos then we pick up pheos that we look for in patients with hypertension. We also know, I showed you in the kidney, little speckles of fat. We can see fatty adrenal lesions, myelolipomas. The challenge with myelolipomas is not malignancy, but over 5 cm they can spontaneously bleed. But many of them are under 5 cm and they're leave alone lesions. Don't worry about this lesion. The size will bother you and maybe something will have to be done but it's a benign lesion. And not every myelolipoma has that much fat. It could look like this with punctate fat and punctate calcifications. That's a myelolipoma. When they get over 5 cm, they'll be removed because as in this case, it looks like the lesion has bled. And so that becomes very important. Again, there's no problem with potential of malignancy, but it's bleeding and rupture of the adrenal and retroperitoneal hemorrhage. And you can see this case with all the swirls within it and its size and the patient had symptoms, this is coming out. The high density probably relates to a prior bleed. Now again, myelolipomas are benign lesions. They never become malignancy. It's just the propensity to bleed when they get large will be why the lesions are resected, typically over 5 cm. Again, you don't want to confuse a myelolipoma with a metastasis. Now, there's several other things that happen with incidental adrenal lesions. Sometimes they're not incidental, and that is they're not incidental adrenal lesions. They're incidental other lesions. When you look at this case, Quickly, it looks like a mass in the region of the adrenal. But when you, and in fact, this patient was sent to adrenal conference. But when we looked at the lesion carefully, we recognized that it was really coming from the stomach and it was a gist tumor. We also have to recognize that not every adrenal lesion is going to be benign. That's incidental. Here was a patient with ulcerative colitis and you see a left adrenal mass. That's not four centimeters and that has nodes. This was an incidental adrenal cancer. Now, I used to think that you don't see primary adrenal carcinomas, that it presents with symptoms of flank pain, which it can, but they're larger, typically. They can be smaller, and then they present with Cushing's. But there's been several articles recently that have made the point that a significant proportion of adrenal carcinomas are picked up incidentally. So you really need to think about it. The third thing I'll mention is incidental pancreatic lesions. And we can give a talk for an hour on incidental pancreatic lesions. Most are IPMNs, but how do you manage these patients? 
and pancreatic cystic lesions is the subject of other talks, but let me go through this briefly. Up to 5% of adults have incidental pancreatic lesions. Most are small cysts or IPMNs. And then the question is, how do you follow these lesions? Now, we're not talking about patients who have a family history of pancreatic cancer or BRCA mutations. We're saying an incidental pancreatic lesion. Well, there are now rules about pancreatic lesions and how we follow them. We made this comment years ago at 16 slides, just under 3%. Remember, people have said it's higher than that, and if you look really hard, it is higher than that. The better the scanner, the more cysts you see, and if you go by MR data, it can approach 20%. But here's a typical lesion, body of the pancreas, one centimeter, water density, IPMN, right there. Here it is again on the coronal view. No dilated pancreatic duct, no septations, no nodularity. That's typically gonna be a benign lesion. Here's a larger one. This is in the body. If it was a 40-ish female, you could think about a mucinous cystic neoplasm or MCN as well. But in this case, this was an IPMN. The question is, how often do you follow it? IPMNs can be multiple. Here's one in the uncinate and in the body of the pancreas. And again, which one do you follow? Do you follow both, obviously? If you have to resect something, what do you go after? How do you manage these patients who often have multiple lesions? Remember, one challenge with IPMNs, it's a field defect. So any of the lesions, or even areas that don't have lesions, can be at risk. And here it is very nicely. IPMNs, typically water density, well-defined, often connect to the pancreatic duct. Um, once they're over 3CM, the strategy in the past was simply remove them. Now we tend to be more conservative. We can do EUS. Here's another one with a thin septation. And again, you can see thin septations. The septations get thicker or there's nodules. Then you have to worry about malignancy. It may be an IPMN that's evolving with a high-grade dysplasia. So IPMNs usually are in an older population key is pancreatic duct involvement. If the entire pancreatic duct is over seven millimeters, it's called a main duct IPMN, and those have high incidence of malignancy, and those typically will be removed. The under 3CM well-defined cystic lesion communicating with the pancreatic duct may not be. Now, I mentioned here 1CM is essentially always going to be a main duct IPMN. These days, over 7 millimeters will be doing EUS and taking a look at the pancreatic duct. So that becomes very important. Now, in terms of predicting malignancy in IPMN, a lot's been written. Size over 3CM. Interval growth over 2 millimeters a year. Mural nodules, particularly solid nodules, particularly if they're enhancing. Thickened septations or septations that are enhancing, and then of course clinical symptoms. If a patient has abdominal pain, that cystic lesion is going to be sampled or resected. Now, in terms of recommendations, the recommendations have recently changed. One of the challenges with pancreatic cyst recommendations is that there are rules and guidelines from societies, but then individual hospitals have their own guidelines. Some simple things are make sure you're not dealing with a cirrhosis adenoma. If it's smaller than 3CM, depending on the history, you may need to sample it. If it's under 1CM, you simply need to follow it. Again, this was a white paper from 2010, and a more recent white paper became a little bit more strict in terms of follow-up. Part of the reason, as I mentioned, this was Siani when he was a Mass General, these were their rules, but those rules were different than the ACR guidelines. And again, how often you follow the patient, when do you do EUS, are all things that are controversial. Uh, Mark Bobin made the point that despite published guidance, recommendations are important awareness, fewer than half of follow-up recommendations for focal pancreatic lesions are consistent with the guidelines and considerable variability persists among radiologists. And that was the point. People really didn't trust those guidelines and they had to deal with their own surgeons and their own GI people like us. And so we have our own rules. So that becomes very, very important. However, if you use your own rules, at least you have some consistency. The newest white paper in 2017 by Alec Megabo and colleagues, 
They went for, for a nine-year follow-up in total. They looked at categories based on lesion size, based on patient age. For most patients, we advocate nine to 10-year follow-up. That's a long time, okay? The question is whether you do CT or MR is not the real question. The question is that's a very long time if you talk about 5 to 20% of the population have pancreatic cysts. Someday we'd be spending all our scanners just following cysts up. And here's Megabo's chart and multiple charts depending on the age. So this is something you could look at in your spare time. As I mentioned, we have a lecture just on pancreatic cysts. And we go into this in more detail. But you can see it's not simple. And again, will people follow the guidelines? That's a good question. You can see uh, Alec was very straightforward. The natural history of incidental pancreatic cysts is uncertain. Our recommendations cannot be simple or entirely definitive. Since 2010, several multi-institution and specialty society consensus papers, meta-analysis, and large-scale observational studies have appeared, but the quality of evidence has been characterized as poor and conclusive, and conclusions remain controversial. So basically, we're doing the best we can. And his principles were kind of good. All incidental cysts should be pursued mucinous, unless there's a reason to think it's something else, like multiple septations for a, a serous cyst adenoma. Again, this 9 to 10 year follow-up. Cyst size directs follow-up or intervention. Again, when you read the chart, under 1.5, 1.5 to 2.5, or greater than 2.5, all become specific. Because the flow charts apply to a range of cyst sizes, a patient's cyst can go from one category to the next going from 1.4 to 1.5 changes the recommendations. Development of worrisome features or high-risk stigmata, nodularity, thickened septations, enhancement. Again, that's worrisome features. And then the patients go into the EUS as a next step. And again, prior studies become critical. They always are in radiology, but in IPMNs, looking for size change and growth change becomes important. At Hopkins, when you present to us the pancreatic cyst clinic, you'll end up with typically, depending on the history and family history and personal history, imaging follow-up at three to six months, EUS, and surgery is for main duct IPMNs, mucinous cystic neoplasms, or a lesion growing over three to five millimeters in a year. And here's our results. We published this article. And again, I don't wanna go into this in detail, Making the point, we also have our own cyst uh, triad of how to look at things. And when you follow our rules, the uh, management was different than other places. But again, it's one of the challenges. People really don't know what to do with pancreatic cysts and how aggressive to get. Again, you hate to miss a pancreatic cancer, but you also hate to be following someone for no reason or doing interventional studies for no reason. So in conclusion, multidisciplinary input is very helpful, alters management in 30% of cases. But the key thing, of course, is making sure you have good management in place. And here's just some of the results from our work. Again, we'll talk about this in more detail later. The importance of multidisciplinary conferences is interesting. We talk about that in cancer. But in complex things like multi, uh, like cysts, Multidisciplinary can work very nicely as well. Surgery, um, GI, radiology, pathology are all there. And we can go over and figure out how best to manage the patient and how best to manage risk. So that works out very nicely. With incidental lomas of the pancreas, I want to make the point that now we pick up neuroendocrine tumors. 10 years ago, we could pick up 40%. Now we pick up over 95% and we pick up incidental under one centimeter lesions, like in this case. And the question is, what do you do with small neuroendocrine tumors? Do you biopsy them? Do you resect them? Do you simply follow them? Under one CM now, we're typically following. Over one CM, there's still some controversy. Over two, everybody will remove it. The important thing about neuroendocrine tumors is you see it because you do arterial phase imaging. 
Here's a very obvious lesion in the head of the pancreas, which was an incidental finding. We were doing this patient's kidneys with our arterial phase. And you could see on the venous phase, the lesion is gone. So when you talk about incidental findings, and this is a great example, when you do different phases, some phases like arterial phase are gonna pick up things you can miss on other phases. And so your incidental finding rate is gonna go up, but many of those findings are indeed very, very important. And again, this article by Herrera, talking about incidental detection of neuroendocrine tumors has substantially increased over the last decade due to widespread use of imaging studies, but equally important how we do the studies with lots of arterial phase imaging. Again, how do you manage these patients? There's lots of controversy. Size tends to be an issue, but again, there is controversy, for example, on the one to two centimeter lesions, what needs to be done. People looking at the KI67 index, seeing whether that can be helpful. There's a lot of work going on. But again, under the category of incidental omas, you will pick up the most common thing or incidental pancreatic cysts or cystic lesions, which end up being IPMNs. You're going to pick up some neuroendocrine tumors. And the fact is, you're also going to pick up occasionally a pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Now, as we transfer from pancreas to spleen, something that overlaps are splenules, which simulate neuroendocrine tumors in the tail of the pancreas. But I'll tell you what, let's stop here and we'll come back and start talking about the spleen and some other important topics. See you in a couple minutes. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.